son is ready for our upcoming hot day holiday which is thanksgiving and usually this time of year is one of my favorite because it reminds me to give thanks you know we were supposed to be thanks every day but this reminds me especially to be thankful for the things that we have our lives and we appreciate you just watching today so we thank you once again today we're going to continue our study in the revelations book and if you don't have a study guide we're going to be in revelations chapter four so we appreciate you again and welcome to our broadcast and as, as stated we're excited uh, i know that many of you are enjoying this book of revelation and uh, you're seeing some some things that you've never seen and understanding some things that you've never understood before and that's great uh, that's wonderful. You're expanding uh, your spiritual understanding and, and at the same time stamping out spiritual ignorance. When you began to look at the book of Revelation, just remember, as we stated at the beginning of, uh, of this book, that this is the only book in your Bible that has a threefold blessing attached to it. It's a blessing to read it. God said, I'm going to bless you if you read it. I'm going to bless you uh, if you hear it being read or taught. And I'm going to bless you as you obey uh, what is uh, written therein. So a threefold blessing. Uh, also remember, we've been dealing with the seven churches. And uh, we've already uh, gone through all seven of those churches uh, to date. And, and uh, each one of those churches, again, they, what Jesus said to them is very relevant today. And the reason being that we have the same spirits that we have to deal with today as a, a gathering body of believers that they had some 2,000 years ago. I, I emphasize to you at the beginning of the broadcast that there are no new spirits that are causing problems in the church. These spirits have been around since the fall uh, of Satan, and uh, they, are, they know what to do. They work generations. Uh, they work uh, families. Uh, they work nations. They work uh, uh, entities, and, and, and they work hierarchies, and, and they've been operating this way for uh, since, the, since the creation of man. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to have to deal with many different kinds of spirits today, but we're going to have to deal with the same spirits that Satan is just packaging them just a little differently for our generation, meaning they've gotten better at doing uh, what they were doing some 2,000 years years ago. So these, uh, these messages, uh, these instructions, the way Jesus dealt with each one of these churches is very relevant for today because this is the way that we are to deal with these spiritual uh, uh, circumstances and situations uh, and incidences in our churches today. Remember in the uh, Ephesian church it was called a loveless church. They left their first love. The uh, Smyrna church uh, was a suffering church. They were going through a lot of things, uh, but they still held on and they were faithful to the uh, word, the will, and the purpose of God. The Pergamos church was a compromising church. In other words, uh, they were living all they knew to live, but they were actually allowing uh, certain compromising teachings mm -hmm. and standards to operate in their midst. Uh, then we had the Thyatira church, which was a heretic church. They had a lot of false teaching and false doctrine and, and heresy going on in that church. Uh, the Sardis church was a dead church, which means that they, uh, they had a good reputation, but that's all they had. Uh, and it was with man and not with God. Right. Then we had the Philadelphia church, uh, which was a faithful church. Um, nothing, uh, they were not doing anything wrong. God just told them, stay the course. I've got a reward for you. Uh, you're doing a great job, and I'm blessing you where you're at and with what you're going through, but I'm going to continue to bless you. Then, of course, we had the Laodicean church, which we just finished, which was considered to be a conforming church. Uh, Romans 12 and 2, be not conformed to the world. Well, this was a worldly church. Right. It was a conforming church, and so they were neither hot nor cold, but they were, according to Jesus' descriptive uh, 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 definition of who the state and the condition they were in, they were a lukewarm church. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about the letters, you know, in the Revela in Revelation, because they were all different. They were the different churches. They were all different. And that's how it is with the Word of God in our lives. Even though there's 66 books, you know, it's certain things that speak to us in certain seasons of our lives. And it, until we find the 
the uh, relevancy of that word, we won't be able to apply it and make it practical to our lives. So I love the way the Lord, he writes some personal letters, so to speak, to these churches. He's kind of like addressing that letter personally to you. This is what I see. This is where you need to come up. And this is what I want to do for you. This is where you're lacking. This is where you're doing great. So these letters are all personal. So we have to make sure, even in the word of God, like this big love letter to us, I call it a love letter from God. He is telling us all these wonderful things that we have to make sure we're finding the relevancy, the practical use of the word of God. It's not just for ancient times. It's not just for the Old Testament believers, but it is so relevant today. It's so pure and it's so, um, it's just, uh, it brings life to today. And without the word of God, we we can't know how to move forward. And I think about what the word Bible, when people say, well, what does the word Bible mean? And a lot of said it's the acronym for um, biblical instruction before leaving earth and that's what these letters are i think about it's the same concept not just revelation but every single letter of the word of god that we have so so it's practical so neglecting the book of revelation mm-hmm. is neglecting your spiritual empowerment mm-hmm. with god did you hear what i said neglecting the book of revelation is neglecting your spiritual empowerment uh, with God. Why? Because it lets us know what's going on. It stabilizes our confidence in Christ in that we know what the next step is. Mm-hmm. Uh, this entire world, especially this country, they're trying to understand and determine what next. We already know what is next as believers. God has revealed it to us in this particular book of the Bible. Now, remember, you can get your study guide for this, and there are three parts uh, to this uh, study in the book of Revelation. Uh, those of you that have requested part one, uh, you've, uh, I pray you've received them by now. Some of you may not have it yet. If you don't, again, just go on our website and uh, fill out the form requesting your free copy of, uh, of uh, part one, and you'll, you'll receive it within, I'll say, maybe about three to seven days. Now, just remember this. We're going to be going to part two in just a couple of other broadcasts. Okay. And when we go to part two, although we have your information, although we have received your, uh, your addresses to automatically send you uh, another uh, copy, we would like for you to request again part two. Uh, the reason we want to do this is because some of you may decide you don't want to uh, uh, to stay along with us anymore. And if that is the case, we would like to send that copy we were going to send to you. We'd like to send it to someone else because there, there's so many that are requesting those copies now. Mm-hmm. So many that are wanting them that if you uh, sense that you would rather not have a, a copy, then please let us know uh, through uh, the way you respond to a part two. Mm-hmm. But those of you who are studying with us, This study guide is invaluable, not only for while we're going over this book, but also it will help you to have something in your private possession that you can go back and spend your private study time going over it again. Remember, these seven churches, again, Jesus was not talking to individual churches. That's why he had a plural uh, behind the closing of each one of those churches. He said, let those that have ears to hear, let the churches that have ears to hear uh, receive what I'm I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So in Ephesians and all these other areas or regions, there were churches, not a church, Mm -hmm. but there were churches. Mm -hmm. And again, there was not just seven churches operating in that day. There were probably thousands of churches operating then. And all of those churches, these Uh, This book of Revelation was circulated among all of those churches and was relevant for their time and is still relevant today because we still deal with the same spirits, with the same issues and the same problems. Our our warfare is not with flesh and blood, darlings. It's against spiritual wickedness in high places. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds as we are obedient to what God commanded us to do. That's right. And as we continue to pray and and war in the spirit, so to speak, we we may not see results right away. And I think about what you said. You know, our warfare is not natural, but it's spiritual. So we got to continue to pray, continue to believe God for what he's going to do. And we have to remember there's some things in the word that we will not be able to change, but those things that we can change and can make a difference in, 
we must do our part regardless of what it looks like and fight with the spiritual weapons that we have been commissioned to fight with in Ephesians chapter 6. Now, go ahead. You just, just, just realize, mm-hmm. darling, God is not all about changing the world. Mm-hmm. He is all about changing you. That's right. You see, the world is already set on a course. We cannot change the world. That's right. Why? Because the world is separate from us. We are enemies in essence. In other words, the world is enmity against God. So we're not trying to change the world. Stop trying to change the world. Change yourself. If you want to get rid of hatred, if you want to get rid of all kinds of different uh, uh, physical uh, or natural manifestations that are contrary to Christ, eliminate those things in your life through the word of God. God does not want to change the world system. He wants to change you and bring you deeper into the kingdom system of operating. That's right. And that requires, you know, pulling down strong strongholds. And I, we like to call them strong mindsets because that's what they are. Because we get so used to operating in a certain way. You know, although the Bible tells us to do it to others that we would have them do it to us, we still have this, if we, depending on how we grew up, it's like, well, if they hit me, I'm going to hit them back. So we have to remember it's a continual process of renewing your mind, renewing your spirit, making sure you're doing things the way God requires us to do it, not how you, the strong mindset you've been brought up with. Because even in our own lives, I know for me personally, even though I'm growing and mature in the Lord, there's still some very strong mindsets that I have that it takes work to pull them down. And I was telling the pastor the other day, it feels like sometimes I'm at war. And it's like I have the, the good angel on one side and the, the bad angel on this side. One telling me this, one telling me that. But I have to remember, it's strong mindsets. It's not that I'm one against the devil. It's my the way I used to think versus the way God has called me to think. And so we have to remember, the easier it is to say, you know what, I'm just going to pull it down because that's what the word, the word of God says, the more you're going to be able to grow and walk into those things God has called you to do because that takes time to war. You know, like I said, when you're struggling, that means there's two things warring against each other. But when you let go, that gives God an opportunity to stand up in your life and you submit your will and your way to him and you're able to go forth in the power that he's already given you. So you have to remember, the battle is in our minds oftentimes and it's with those strong mindsets, whether it be something that we've been taught or something we've been uh, learned throughout the years through observation. So, so you see, um, in moving forward, and we're going to be moving into chapter 4 in just a minute, okay. dealing with the throne of God. But in, in moving forward, uh, just remember this, darling, your greatest warfare is not against the devil. He has been defeated. Right. Your greatest warfare is against yourself, against selfishness, against self-centeredness, mm-hmm. against the things that, that war of strong mindsets. And, you know, some would say, well, you know, the devil's making me do this or the devil's making me do that. Right. The devil can't make you do a thing. Amen. All he can do is deceive you. All he can do is mess with your your perception, mm-hmm. mess with your thought patterns, mess with all these. But the only way he can do that is for you not to have established the transformed thought patterns that come through the renewing of your mind. Mm-hmm. So when you begin to look at uh, the Bible, some folks say, well, you know, uh, whenever Peter began to rebuke the Lord, the Lord uh, rebuked Satan and said, uh, uh, Satan, you know, you don't say the things of God. Again, you got to remember, Peter did not have the Holy Spirit. Again, none of them had the Holy, none of the 12, none of the 72, none of the 120 had the baptism of the Holy Spirit in their lives until after Jesus was seated at the right hand of God. So a lot of the times, the the, the character realizations that we we use uh, the uh, you know well Peter he was uh, he was hard headed and he was stubborn and a, a lot of these patterns darling a lot of these natural mm-hmm. ways that they were operating happened before they received the yeah. spirit of God right. but we have the spirit of God so we can actually take authority over certain things that the disciples prior to their being baptized could not take authority over again. 
many of God's people are not aware of that simple teaching because they haven't truly studied the Bible. That's why I, I say stop trying to be like you saw the, the apostles were when Jesus walked the earth. They were far from, from being able to obey the Lord the way they should. Mm -hmm. They obeyed him out of the flesh. Right. But when the day of Pentecost came, mm -hmm. when the Holy Spirit uh, was actually given to the church, that's when they began to know the authority and the power of obeying God in the Spirit. That's right. Very important for you to know that as a child of God. Amen. And it comes with submitting yourself to the Spirit. It's one thing to have the Spirit, but do you walk in the Spirit? And Romans 8, um, chapter 8 goes into that as far as, you know, living in the Spirit, you must walk in the Spirit. Not just live there, have the Spirit with inside of you, but you got to obey Him. You know, He can't just be saying, go go right all the time and then you say you know I, yeah i think i'm gonna go left today just because you want to you if you when you have the holy spirit in your life there's also you have to walk in the spirit so it's a difference between just saying you know i'm spirit spirit filled but you don't live a spirit filled life you got to make sure you're walking in those precepts that he's telling you because the spirit of, of god leads us and guides us in all truth he is a leader means that means we need to be following him not just um, you know, okay, thank you for that advice, but I think I still want to take my own advice. That's not what the Spirit of God is for. He is a leader and a guide. So we have to look at all that concerning the Word of God, even in the book of Revelation, like we said, and we're seeing the, the past, present, and future of what God is wanting to show us. So, so now uh, John is getting ready to move out of the present mm -hmm. and begin to look at some things that are uh, in the future. But just remember now, God has a, a strange way of, of teaching mm -hmm. In that sometimes he'll give the beginning and give the ending before the beginning. Right. And at other times he will give you something that's going on and then he'll come back and emphasize it more and share more about it mm -hmm. uh, uh, following. So Revelation is not written in a consecutive order, mm -hmm. but there's a moving back and forward throughout the book of Revelation as God tries to open it up to us. And as John, who is seeing certain things, darling, that no one has ever seen before. Mm -hmm. He is actually, uh, was actually uh, translated into glory, into and up to the throne of God. So, you know, he was using his limited vocabulary mm -hmm. to describe things that he had mm -hmm. never seen before. It's almost like a caveman trying to explain to the other cavemen about uh, airplanes and about cell phones. Mm -hmm. It's about like those who were living in the 15th and 16th century being able to look into the 21st century and then have to explain or describe what they're seeing by their limited vocabulary. So just remember, mm -hmm. uh, John was naturally blind. Right. He could not see, mm -hmm. but he was seeing in the spirit. Now, this chapter gives us a glance through the eyes of John, mm -hmm. and we're talking the spiritual eyes of John into what we will call the third heaven. Now, the reason we call it the third heaven uh, is because the Apostle Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, that he was caught into the uh, third heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way he described it. Uh, we may talk about it today like dimensions, but it's, it's all the self and say he went to a place that you cannot see with the natural eye that it takes a, a spiritual transformation to be able to see. Mm -hmm. And it actually uh, boggles the imagination trying to perceive the magnificence mm -hmm. of what the apostle uh, John actually was looking at. I mean, this was something that was beyond the, the natural. This was supernatural uh, revelation or seeing and perceiving where God is. Can you imagine mm -hmm. what it's like to be uh, a, a, at the throne of God, able to see where God is sitting, able to see the activities that are going on uh, around the throne? Well, as believers, we know that, that this is not a fantasy. That's right. This is not the uh, figment of someone's imagination or the, uh, I'll, I'll say the disenchantment or the disorientation of John mm -hmm. having gone through a lot of trauma. No, darlings, this is talking about and giving us a spiritual, a, a spiritual view of how it is around the throne of God. And as believers, you know, we, we, we got to recognize that, uh, that heaven is real. Mm -hmm. 
there is a place uh, that is called heaven, and that place is where God uh, abides uh, in the uh, in the literal form uh, for the sake of having a dimension or a realm uh, where all spirit beings uh, can actually operate and function without being hindered by the natural uh, perception or perspective of things. So, you know, as you begin to look at this, it's amazing how uh, uh, the, this is just in line with what God does. In 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, the, the uh, second chapter, the statement is made, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But then the, and if you start reading that, you say, well, you know, it, it behooves us to recognize that there's some things that are mystique and mysterious that we're never going to know. And, and you know, there's some things that God just does not intend us to know. Well, the devil is a lie because God is not a God that leads us blindly around, but he gives us truth. He gives us revelation. He gives us understanding. And that very next verse makes that statement clear as to how he does it. That next verse says, but he has given us the spirit who is able to reveal to us yeah. all the things that, that eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, neither have entered into our heart. They are revealed to us by his spirit. That's right. And, and I like that next verse that says about the deep things, they, even the deep things of God. Now, if you look at what John describes, you know, as you read this particular chapter, mm -hmm. on the natural side, it sounds like sci-fi. It sounds like something that's just totally out of this world. But on the spiritual side, you, you're overwhelmed because you realize all that it represents, all that it is, and it humbles you. And it's like, my goodness, you know, you realize this had to be an experience, not just natural, um, spiritually speaking, but naturally speaking with, with, to his flesh. Well, we have to realize it's the same concept. God revealed those deep things to us, but they have to be revealed to us by our spirits because in the natural you're not going to be able to comprehend it. And a lot of times it's funny. The Lord will be having a conversation, and he'll remind me how small my brain is. You're, like, you're trying to get out. You're under, trying to understand this in your natural, finite mind. It's never going to work. You have to understand it from a spiritual perspective. And when I go to God and I'm trying to understand things that he showed me, understand things in his word through my natural eyes, trying to get a visual, as I call it, you know, that's not going to work. You have to remember it's through and by the Spirit of God that we have to see so to speak, like John said, did, and then that's when it becomes limitless. In the natural, I have limitations to what I can see, to what I can understand, but in the spirit realm, there's no limitations because it's spiritual and it's forever and perpetually expanding. So, so you see, and and it, this is the key in rightly dividing the word. Mm -hmm. Now, now I want to share uh, something with you, and I want you to, I want to take your mind for just a moment and and just. Just see if I can stretch the boundaries of your memory mm -hmm. to see that the spiritual perception you have uh, should actually open up certain things for you. Let, let me give you an example. The, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, when the Spirit of God filled the temple that Solomon built for the Lord, the Bible said that no one, the Spirit was so huge, mm -hmm. it was so large, uh, it was so, uh, um, so presence uh, consuming mm -hmm. that no one could go into the entire temple. That temple had thousands of square feet in it, yet that temple, when it was filled with the Spirit of God, no other presence could go into that temple. Now, now get this. Uh, you may ask yourself, uh, well, well, you know, how big uh, is a soul? Mm -hmm. well, well, think about this, darling. In, inside of each one of us, we all have a soul. Mm -hmm. But did you know that your soul uh, according to what we have seen with demon-possessed ones in the Bible. Remember, Legion had a thousand demons inside of him. That's right. His soul could contain 1,000 demons. Mm -hmm. Yet there was a whole herd of swine that when those demons came out of the soul of this uh, this man called Le this, this uh, man whose demons were called Legion, when those, that Legion of spirits came out of that man, did you know that an entire herd of swine could not That's contain right. them? Right. See, you, you, need to, you need to change your view. You're, you're limiting God to what you see in the natural, not realizing that God is supernatural. Mm -hmm. Now, what the builders can't hold, mm -hmm. 
what the builders can't contain, what animals can't hold, what animals can't contain. On the day of Pentecost, God filled 120 men and women with the Spirit of God. And on that day, some 3,000 others were added. And today, the multitudes that have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But, you know, we, the soul of man, the, the spirit of man can contain what natural builders can contain. We can contain what the, uh, the uh, animals can't contain. Inside of us, the Holy Spirit is within us. And the Bible tells us in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians says, You are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells inside of you. Expand your mindset, darlings. Recognize that the greatness inside of you far outweighs the greatness outside of you. And we're talking about the throne of God here. And we're talking about John seeing the throne of God. But did you know that wherever God establishes his authority, that's where his throne is? So inside of us, just remember as we go through this, um, this chapter, just remember the throne of God that we are being told about. A part of that throne lives inside of each one of us. Because the Father said, Jesus said it. He said, if you believe in me, like the scripture says, and receive us, he said, then I and the Father will come and make our abode with you. We will dwell inside of you, and uh, we will sup together. Just remember this, darlings, the throne of God. We do not have to search for the throne of God by going into the third heaven. We know the throne of God rents and rules inside of us if we allow him to. The Spirit of God on the inside of us. So you may be asking, how can you get caught up in the Spirit while you're still in the flesh? Well, you get caught up into the third heaven. You get caught up into a place where the Spirit rules. And where the Spirit rules, there are no limitations. Did you hear what I said? Where the Spirit rules, there is no limitation. So if you will allow the Spirit of God to rule inside of you, then you will find that there is no, absolutely no limitations to what God is able to do and what God is able to perform when you operate in the spirit and not in the flesh. Amen. Now, Ruth, let's look at that first uh, verse in chapter 4, if you will, Revelation chapter 4. And it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was it, as if it were a trumpet talking with me, which says, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And one of the things that, uh, it was so many things in this particular verse, but I think about what it says, Come up hither, you know, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. He talks about what the voice of the Lord sounded like, a trumpet, you know. <laughs> you know, you think about in the natural what a trumpet sounds like. And then it says, Come up hither. He beckoned him to come up. And I think about when you're talking about the natural versus the spiritual and the, the, the importance of making sure we expand our, our, thought, our thoughts in the natural. It's the same here. When I think about coming up, when he told him to come up, we have to come up as well as far as coming up. How do we come up? We mature. And we realize there are certain things that God wants to reveal to us, but they will not be revealed until we are spiritually mature enough to handle it. So we have to take notes on this particular scripture when it says, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be here, must be hereafter. So he wanted him to, he wanted to show him some things. But before he began to show him those those things, he had to come up. So we must use this same analogy in our own lives. There are so many things that God wants to show us. And we were talking about this the other day when Jesus was with the disciples. He even told them, There's so many things I want to share with you, but you know, you can't bear them right now. But when I leave, you'll understand the same principle. God wants to show us some things, some deep things, but we've got to come up, just like it says in this particular first verse. So then in this first verse of this fourth chapter, it says, after, after this, I look, this is John, mm -hmm. said, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Mm -hmm. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, uh, which said, come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be uh, hereafter. So uh, he began to, to hear the Lord Jesus talking directly to him. 
How do we know this was the Lord Jesus? Because of the descriptive definition uh, he gave us in that, uh, uh, that uh, first chapter of how the Lord's voice sounded. So this was Jesus talking to him. He told him, I need you to come up higher. Well, he was in the flesh. He was in a natural position. But God said, come up higher. And the only way for him to become, uh, uh, get the ability to come higher, he had to get out of the natural realm and into the spirit realm. So what you begin to realize is that something had to happen. Well, that second verse tells us what happened. Mm -hmm. It said, and immediately, the moment Jesus said that to him, John said, I was in the spirit. Yes. And behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So now, listen, Jesus was able to speak a word to John to move him out of the flesh mm -hmm. into the spirit. Now, that lets us all know that the, the, the quickest way to get out of the flesh and into the spirit mm -hmm. is to have the spirit mm -hmm. to beckon unto you to move up higher. Mm -hmm. Whenever we speak today about getting higher, moving higher, sometimes we, we find different ones trying to build a tower and putting a prayer tower up higher because they feel like that's getting higher. Listen to me, darlings. Whenever we talk about higher in the Lord, mm -hmm. we're not talking from a physical perspective. We're talking a spiritual perspective. Mm -hmm. You could be down in the valley yes. and high in the Lord. You could be physically at the bottom of a well and still spiritually get high in the Lord. Mm -hmm. I encourage you to recognize that you, if you are sensing a lot of battles in the flesh, mm -hmm. you are living too low. Mm -hmm. Get out of the flesh and get into the spirit and let God do what he does best. Expand your horizon. Mm -hmm. See, sometimes, darlings, we just, we just look too much in the natural. The Lord is wanting us to come higher. Mm -hmm. God is wanting us not to just have the spirit of God inside of us, but he's wanting us to walk in the spirit, yes. to live in the spirit. He told John here, he said, come up higher. And John said immediately uh, he was actually uh, uh, in the spirit, mm -hmm. and immediately he began to see the throne of God. That's right. And we have to realize that, you know, he wanted to show him what was in the near future. And how many of us could make better decisions if we knew what was ahead? We say all the time, well, God, if I knew this was going to happen, I would have made a better decision. Mm -hmm. Well, if I knew that, I would have went this way. Well, that's what God wants us to do. And the only way we can get what he wants to show us is to come higher. So you got to remember, there is a reason that he wants us to come higher. There's a reason that he wants to show us what's the near future. So it's for our benefit. He is God. He knows. But these directions, these, inst these instructions are for our benefit. So we'll know the direction that he wants to take. We'll know what to expect. We all know what it's like to be caught off guard, to be surprised. But there should be no surprises with believers because we have a divine connection with the one who holds the future. And Apostle used to say all the time, we should never be caught off guard with things that happen around us. We should never be surprised because we have the, the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. First of all, that comforts us, that gives us some ease about, okay, I, you know, well, you might be surprised, but God is never surprised. And that's what comforts me when something does feel like, I feel like, man, I wish I would have known. I wish this was coming. God reminds me that he knows. And so he has the answer to every solution. And if we stay in his hand, if we stay with him, he's going to lead us, he's going to guide us, and he's going to continue to show us. But we have to be in tune with what he is saying. We have to be in tune with what he wants to show us. We are the ones that put the blinders up. Just like we've been talking about, John was physically blind, but he could see in the spirit. If you cannot see in the spirit, it's not God's fault. We are the one that put the blinders up by neglecting our time with him, by neglecting maturing in him. So don't put blinders up. And we can do that by neglecting to hear him when he speaks. If you continue to reject the, the voice of God, eventually it's going to get kind of mute. It's going to get more mute and mute as you go on. So you have to remember, we are the one that put blinders on, but God wants to open our eyes to what he wants to show us. So, so we, in, in reality... If God did it with John, mm -hmm. he can do it with us. Amen. We just have to be in that place. And when you look around you today and you see all the different things that are going on, and we're trying to find some kind of uh, solace, some kind of understanding, some kind of perspective, God is still right. The Bible is still right. Mm -hmm. Christians, we have a behavior that we operate in when we walk in the spirit. 
We're not judgmental. We're not critical. We're not boastful. We are not arrogant. We are not, in a sense, the kind of individuals who want to hurt anyone or want to belittle anyone or want to tear anyone apart. These are characters that we have from the Spirit of God as we move and operate more in the Spirit of God. John told him in that third verse, he said, he told us, he said, and he that sat was, uh, was to look upon like a jasper and like a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne uh, in sight like unto uh, an emerald. Now, now let's look at this. Let's, let's break it down. First, the appearance of God's glory. Uh, now, now, <laughs> you know, this, we're talking about being in the spirit uh, uh, on the Lord's day. We're talking about God dealing with us from a spiritual perspective. Now, you know, a lot of us today, we want the glory of God in our midst. And uh, from a biblical perspective, if, the, if God is inside of you, then that means you do not have to find a way to bring the glory of God in your midst. When you show up, the glory of God shows up because you do not come looking for the glory of God. You come bringing the glory of God inside of you. So if the glory of God's manifestation is going to, to appear, then it's going to be by the way God's glory manifests itself through you. What John said here, he said the appearance of God's glory uh, was as Jasper. Now Jasper of that day uh, is uh, is actually like the diamonds of our day. So to the, the appearance of God's glory was like a diamond. If you can envision within yourself the uh, luminosity and the uh, purity uh, that, that is, is, is uh, contained in looking at a diamond, then that's what it was like to see the glory of God. To see the glory of God was like seeing uh, diamonds. Also, he went on to say, and a sardine, uh, a, a stone, a uh, 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 sardine, which is, uh, that was an orange red kind of stone that was very bright and extremely luminous, which means that it was translucent. If you can imagine a reddish hue and imagine that kind of appearance. Now, he did not say that this was a sardine stone. He did not say that this was a jasper. He was using what he understood to describe the luminosity and the uh, brilliance of what he was looking at. So, Donna's heaven is a beautiful place. It's a place, uh, the third heaven is a place where when you get there, you do not want to come back. A lot of us, we, we cry and we bereave our loved ones when they go to heaven. But listen, once they leave here and once they get to where God is, darling, there is no desire to come back. There's no more crying. There's no more grieving for them because they are in the presence of God. And that's where we all want to be. It went on to tell us that there was a rainbow there and it was emerald or a translucent green in color. What is the significance of a rainbow being in heaven? Go back to the Old Testament, and the rainbow was actually given to Noah as a pro as a sign of a promise that God was going to keep. So you see, the rainbow uh, in its first inception into man's realm was to show that it was God sealing a promise. So when you go into the glory of God, when you get around the, thr the throne, then just remember that there are they're, they're actually symbols around the throne that help us to understand that God is a God who keeps his promises. That rainbow was green. The rainbows we see uh, have several different colors of the spectrum, but around the throne of God, that rainbow was emerald green and translucent. Can you picture in your mind's eye what it must have been like for John being on the Isle of Patmos and yet being caught up into the third heaven and now looking at the actual throne of God and all the activities going along or going around uh, or happening around the throne of God. That's right. When I think about Psalms 16 and 11, you know, mm -hmm. talking about the glory and the presence of God, it says, Thou will show me the path of life, and thy pres presence before me for good. 
at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And to me it reminds me of what John must have been experiencing. He was experiencing the presence of God, the fullness of joy. Mm-hmm. At thy right hand there are um, pleasures forevermore. This is, you know, it describes to me when I see what he saw and what we, you know, we feel when we're in the presence of God. And this is the thing when you're talking about the glory. You don't have to search for the glory. You don't have to search for the presence because the presence is in you. If you have Christ, then you have the presence of God with you all the time. So we have to remember it's the same concept. If you find yourself not feeling joyous or not feeling like, you know, I just can't find God, I just can't feel God, you got to remember he is in you. And when when he's in you, you have those fullness of joy and you have those pleasures forevermore. But you got to remember where the glory is and where the presence is. If you have the Holy Spirit, they're inside of you. And what's really interesting when you when you look at this uh, this actual uh, literal description of John you know, being in the spirit and, and in the third heaven and seeing the throne of God, something so beautiful, mm-hmm. something so magnificent, something so supernatural, something that is just full of just just beauty. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you talk about the glory of God here, mm-hmm. and as you stated there, when you began to realize that that same glory. A part of that same glory is inside of each one of us. Seriously, what John saw there, a part of that glory is on the inside of you. Mm -hmm. It's on the inside of your brother or your sister. How can you hate Mm -hmm. someone that's full of that kind of glory? Mm -hmm. How can you mistreat someone that has that kind of glory on the inside of them? It's because we judge a lot of people by the flesh instead of by the spirit. Mm -hmm. But if you begin to realize that we all, all of us Mm -hmm. that have the spirit of God, Mm -hmm. we have this kind of glory on the inside of us. We have this kind of a glorious Mm -hmm. manifestation of the presence of God dwelling on the inside of us. How can I hate you with all of that glory you've got inside of you? How can I mistreat you or not love you when we both have the same glory? On the inside. You see, darlings, when I get into the book of Revelation, I get excited. Because what I see that John saw, I realize that that is something that's on the inside of us and something that's also waiting for us in the in the uh, time of our translation into glory. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, this is great. He says, and round about the throne, that fourth verse, he said there were four and twenty seats. Now, now get this. John saw something in heaven that, that, that he called seats, right. chairs uh-huh. in heaven. What? Chairs in heaven? <laughs> man created chairs here on earth. Mm-hmm. How could man create chairs here on earth and God borrow from man to put chairs in heaven? Oh, you got it twisted, darling. You got it all backwards. What you see on earth, God already has it in heaven. Mm-hmm. You need to understand a lot of the things we're seeing today that we're calling and saying that you were giving thanks to man for having created it, all it amounts to is God shared a little bit of his wisdom so that man could make the chairs, so that man could create cars, so that man could build buildings. All of this stuff, all of it originates in God. When you get to heaven, it's not going to be a place filled with mysterious items. Most of the things that we have built on this earth God already had them existing in heaven. When we pray the prayer, darlings, we do not pray God help us to be able to create uh, something down here that, that's similar to what it is in heaven. No, he said, you pray, when you pray, Father, uh, please uh, create things or, or let things be here on earth as they are in heaven. God already has everything that's needed and necessary for us to enjoy the abundance of being glorified in the presence of God. But there was 24 elders sitting around the throne. And look at what it said. I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. 24 men, Mm -hmm. elder men sitting around the throne clothed in white with a gold crown 
on their head. First thing that popped in my spirit when I first read this some 30 years ago was who who are these 24 elders? What is the significance of 24 elders? Well, you begin to look at the, the, the fact that, again, 24 is 212s. Mm -hmm. well, what's the significance of 212? There are 12 tribes, the tribes of Israel. Guess what? Jesus shows 12 disciples. 12 and 12 is 24. So we began to recognize that numbers with God are important. Mm -hmm. now, now, I know that just threw some of y'all uh, just lost your, your, your religion. But, but but numbers are important. They mean something. They signify something. We duplicate different sets and subsets here on earth. And many times we need to recognize that God has sets and subsets and different orders even in glory. So he saw 24 seats. They had 12, uh, 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 24 elders. And when you look at that from a, a, a perspective of how does that translate uh, into our understanding, you're talking about the fullness of the tribe of Israel or the fullness of God's chosen people. And then with the 12 apostles, you have the fullness of apostolic authority. So you got the full authority of God being represented in heaven. You got the full authority of God's promises being represented in heaven. You got the full authority of God's chosen people being represented in heaven. And it all comes together to help us to see that God is a covenant God. Yes. God, when he makes a promise, darlings, he keeps his promises. He has evidence all around his throne that reminds him of all the things he's promised to us as mankind. When he created us in the very beginning, the Bible said, he said, let us make man. Well, God didn't make man on the first day. He didn't make him on the fourth day, the, the fifth day. He made man on the sixth day. God created the entire world before he made man. Not because man was not important, but he wanted to make sure that wherever man was to rule and to have authority, he wanted to make sure it was established in such a manner as that he would not be born into a, a void, or born or created into a void. God already had it laid out. Well, it's the same thing today. We need to understand that God is still a God of order. Amen. He has things laid out for us today. And listen, another important thing to realize is that whatever God guides, uh, he is going to provide. And he is not trying to work it out and then pull you in it. He is uh, uh, trying to work it out while he's pulling you in it. Many times God always already wants to prepare the way. So that when you get there, you got it. How do you know? 14th chapter of John's gospel. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. He said, believe also in me. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, he said, I wouldn't tell you. He said, and I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am there, you might be also. Darling, you got to eat the whole book. You, you got to believe the whole Bible. Either God is the greatest liar that ever lived or he's the greatest truth that's ever existed. And I believe he's the greatest truth. What he said he's going to do, what he promised he's going to do. If God says something to you, you can believe it. Amen. And as you were talking about what God for God to provide, I thought about the children of Israel when he was leading them out. You know, in the day, the day when it was light, there was a cloud. And at night, there was a pillar of fire that guided them. And it never left. The Bible talks about it never left. Day and night, and that it was there to lead and guide us. So God has always given us direction. He's always guiding us. He's always showing us the way. But we have to recognize that it's him. We have to recognize, okay, I can't leave this. This is my instruction. This is my guidance. This is my provision. And that's what that cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night provided for them that were being led out of bondage. We have to, the same, the word is what leads us. The Holy Spirit is what keeps us. It's our cloud. It's our pillar of fire by night. They had something in the daytime and they had something in the night. And that's what, you know, I think about Joshua. He said, you know, thy word I meditate on day and night. Mm -hmm. The word of God is our pillar. The word of God is our cloud that leads, that guides and provides for our, our sustenance, provides for our spiritual health mm -hmm. and strength. And we have to have it and realize that's our only true source is the word of God. 
church. See, you see, we need we need the book, we need the Bible, we need the all the things you have studied, all the things you have learned, all of it comes together in this book of Revelation. He said in that fifth verse, and out of the throne proceeded lightning and thundering and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, of uh, which are the seven spirits of God. We are not talking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in number, right. but we're talking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in completeness. Mm -hmm. What we got to understand is there was a completeness. Right. There was a perfection of the flow of the spirit around the throne of God. There were seven lamps of fire, which was the perfect fire of God. When the Bible said that in the uh, uh, in the uh, baptismal work of Christ, mm -hmm. he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. and with fire, I firmly believe that if you've got the Holy Ghost in your life, you've got the fire. Don't be talking about, Lord, send your fire down. If you have the Holy Spirit, Jesus didn't just baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He baptized you also with fire. Fire. That fire is a purifying part of God. There's an awesome display of the glory of God that John is seeing, but it actually is relevant and it relates to where we are today. In that sixth verse, it said, and before the throne, um, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. In other words, as he began to look around the throne, he saw a sea. Now, a sea is water, which means that water is liquid. It flows and it ebbs. Well, around the throne, there was a flow and an ebb that looked like water, uh, that, that acted like water, but looked like glass. It acted and had the qualities, it had the characteristics of a sea, but it was all glass. Can you imagine that? And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before uh, and behind. Now, now, now uh, of course, uh, he, he couldn't understand what he was seeing uh, from the right kind of uh, vocabulary, but he had to use what he was accustomed to to describe something he had never seen in his entire life. He said, he said I see four beasts around the throne. He said, they're, they're, they're full of eyes, mm -hmm. you know, and they, they look like, like, like kind of like, uh, like, like, like animals. And the eighth, the seventh, and eighth verse said, and the first beast was like a lion, mm -hmm. and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Mm -hmm. Now he didn't say that this is what they were, mm -hmm. but he said that's what they looked like. Right. They were similar to, and when he tried to describe how they were acting, how they were operating, how their character was. It was as though they were actually operating uh, in that manner, in that way, in that perspective. So you begin to see that as, as, as you recognize the power of God, begin to recognize also that John was describing something that he had never, ever seen before. And he said, now look at, let's look at it again. The first beast was like a lion. Uh, the second beast was like a calf. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at that and begin to break it down, what do you mean first beast like a lion? Bold, mm -hmm. uh, fearsome, kingship, uh, in character and appearance. What about the second beast? Say so he was like a calf. Okay, we're talking praise. We're talking sacrifice. We're talking redeeming in character uh, appearance. The third beast had a face like his man. Talk about humanity. The likeness of God, a dominion, and uh, in character and appearance. Fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Mm -hmm. We're talking swiftness, king, uh, perception, mm -hmm. uh, protective character, and appearance. And each had six wings right. uh, for transport. Uh, those six wings had a purpose. Two of them was for transport. Two of them was for covering. Mm -hmm. And two of them was for shielding. Two covered their face. Mm -hmm. Two covered their feet, and two, they were able to fly with. And it said their eyes were full uh, within, meaning they could see in all directions, in all ways, they were omniscient in their being able to see everywhere. They never rested, meaning they were, they were continuing all the time in this way. They never stopped. When you began to look at heaven, when you began to look at what John saw, Darling, there was activity there. There was not one single moment of quietness. 
of settledness, of any kind of stillness, but it was active. And these are uh, these uh, beasts that we saw there, these ones that were, were floating around, these were what we have found throughout the Bible to be seraphims. Mm -hmm. They were they were actually angels that were responsible for guarding the throne of God and for being around the the the, 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 the holy realm of glory. And these angels were constantly uh, giving glory and honor and thanks. It said uh, in that 19 through 11, it said, When these beasts give our glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who lived forever, it said, When they did that, then the four and twenty elders would fall down before the throne, uh, and they would worship the one on the throne, saying, That liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns mm -hmm. before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Mm -hmm. So you see, this was a great audience of worship, mm -hmm. of praise, mm -hmm. of magnifying and glorifying God. Amen. And one thing that sticks out, is, and I love, is they repeatedly did it. They did it day and night. They didn't need any rest. And you know, on this side, on natural side, we need rest. We have to have our rest to be able to function. But when we get to glory, it excites me to know that what I feel in my spirit sometimes, sometimes it just overwhelms our flesh. But when we feel the presence of God, we know he's there and we're worshiping him. But one day we're going to be in the, and just like they were, they are, and were, they were worshiping and did not tire. Can you imagine being able to be before the throne of God and never get tired? It never gets old. But this is what they were doing. And I, I love the fact that with the Holy Spirit in our lives, whether we can do it physically or not, our spirit can continue to rejoice. Even in the, the hard times of our lives, our spirit has the ability to rejoice. Our spirit has the ability to praise God and realize that he is our source of strength. And as we're praising God, as we're worshiping God, he's also reciprocating that and filling us with strength, filling us with hope, filling us with comfort. And I think about the dream that Jacob had, the ladder, you know, angels descending and, and descending. It's the same concept, you know, when we're praising God, when my spirit is in fellowship with him, not only am I giving him praise, not only am I worshiping him, but I am receiving something from God. I'm receiving those things from God that I did not realize that I needed. All I know is that I needed him. I needed something from him. And that's how it is when we're praising God, when we're worshiping God. And it's everlasting. It's perpetual. In our spirit, it never gets old. And one thing the apostle, he, you know, he reminds me all the time. He says, this is the way to know that you're working the outside of the spirit. When you get tired, when your flesh gets tired, you have to know, okay, that's your flesh. But you have to always know the spirit is part of us. That's, you know, that's strengthened by God. He is not flesh and blood, so he doesn't get tired. So we have to realize, okay, I need to receive grace or walk in that grace to fulfill my assignment, to fulfill my mandate. Because the spirit never tires. And we have to be just like these, these angels that worship, these elders that worship. And I thank God for this this powerful uh, presentation in my mind and in my spirit because it gives me excitement and joy for what is to come, what we're going to experience one day. And it's exciting to know that it won't be like this always. I won't be limited to this flesh and blood body always. You, you know, I, I, I also like to think about it uh, this way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been in ministry for, for quite a few years and I've gone through a lot of different challenges physically mm -hmm. While I've actually did what God has uh, commanded me to do, but in doing so, there's something that I discovered. Regardless of what I'm going through physically, mm -hmm. I mean, I can walk right. I used to walk right out of the out of the uh, field, uh, the farm field, from working on the farm and walk right into the pulpit. I used to work at, at a uh, at a warehouse loading and unloading church church trucks, mm -hmm. and I've been able to do that and then walk right out of that and minister or preach. Or, or, or teach. But I found out something a long time ago. Mm -hmm. When you get in the spirit, mm -hmm. tiredness leaves. Mm -hmm. It's the strangest thing. I don't know how to explain it other than when you are in the spirit, you're tapping into the supernatural strength of God. So sometimes I will wear my flesh out. I will get tired in the flesh mm -hmm. just so that I can get into that realm where the spirit 
takes over and I get a renewal in strength. And some folks say, well, you need your rest and you need all of this and you need all of that. Daughters, I can tell you right now, when you get in the spirit, all you need is more of God. And you can do better, you can you can work better, you can actually perform better in the spirit than you can in the flesh. Our problem is we love the spirit and we love to cater to, to the spirit. But if you can find a way to begin to exercise yourself being in the spirit more, yeah. meaning pray more, fast more, seek the Lord's will more, study the word of God more, yeah. walk more in the way God would have you to walk, you're going to find a supernatural ability that will manifest itself in your life, which is none other than you're walking in the Spirit. I have had sickness and been able to preach like no sickness was ever around me. Then when I get through ministering, the sickness returns. Why? Because the anointing, darlings, the anointing, there is no weakness. I went to God one time and said, God, it's not fair. I said, I'm sick. I can't hardly get up out of bed yet, but I got to go preach. I can go preach, and then I come back and have to get right back into bed. And you know what he told me? He said, well, why don't you stay in the spirit then? And I'm like, what? <laughs> he said, why don't you stay in the spirit? If every time you get out of my spirit, then you end up getting back to the condition you were in before you got in, don't go back. You know, I, I really, I really believe that if we can get out of the flesh and into the spirit, then we can take authority over the limitations of the spirit and begin to flow in a depth of glory and honor and authority like never before. What you need to recognize is you are far more powerful when you line up with God's word. Did you hear what I said? You are far more powerful when you line up with God's word. What makes you weak is when you're doing things contrary to the word of God. Make an adjustment, darlings. Make an adjustment. Begin to line your life up with the word and watch the supernatural power of God take place. When I read this chapter and read about this throne and what's going on, I get excited because it just gives me a glimpse into my future. And God has to constantly remind me that you don't have to wait until you get here. I'm already in you. I'm already with you. Go ahead and glorify me where you are. Just like they're glorifying me and around the throne. Daughters, we need to be glorifying God now. You know what? I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what's happening in your life. Rejoice. I don't mean make up a laugh. I don't mean make up for joy. I mean reach inside of you and pour the joy out of you that God has embedded in your spiritual DNA. You are far greater than what you're going through. You are far more powerful than what's coming at you. Do not lose yourself in the spirit of the world. Move and shift into the spirit of God. Let God rule in your life. I don't care how much hatred, how much malice, how much evil, how much corruption, how much any of this world is operating in. Prove to the world that you are different because greater is he that lives in you than he that's in the world. Show them that you can love your enemies. Show them that you can be good to those who despitefully use you. Show them that you are not a divider, but you are a peacemaker. Why? Because God said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall see God. Come on, darling. Come on. Rise up, believers. Rise up, Christians. Rise up and let God be God in your life. This Bring the, the, the power of God to play, not by, by talking it, but bring it to play by walking it. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Amen, amen. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that was Lord awesome. have we, mercy. Oh, we're so man. excited. No, we're not going to cut off. We're going to stay here all, all day. <laughs> First, I want to do a Glory thank you for staying with us. I did see your comments about the sound. We will work on that. We thought we had it sorted out. So thank you for your patience on that. But we appreciate God because regardless of that, we were able to still worship in the world we're still able to, to study together so we thank you for your patience and just remember to give thanks in all things romans 8 and 28 still holds true today and it will never get old all things work together for good to those who love god and are called the called according to his purpose so if you love god and you're the called and then you have no worries and everything is working out for your good
So until next uh, time, I thank you for these wonderful opportunities. Yes, we will be back with you. We'll continue sharing with you from the book of Revelation. Don't forget, if you don't have the study manual, go ahead and go online and fill out the form and we'll, ship, we'll get it to you. not going to cost you anything except the time for you to go ahead and, and do that. Remember, there's three parts to what we're teaching, which means that we're going to be through with this part in a couple of weeks. And then you'll need to request part two. And then we'll get done with that part three. We're going to go right up to the rapture uh, with this particular part. And uh, then we're going to start in the, the first part of the tribulation with part two. And then the uh, final part of the tribulation with part three. But it's exciting. It's wonderful. We are excited. We are stirred up. And I can tell you right now, uh, although... Everything is working on the outside, even some of it against us. Remember this, greater is he that's in you yes. than he that's in the world. And with God, all things are possible to them that believe. God bless you. Amen. We love you. Looking forward to being with you on Tuesday. Amen. God bless you. Glory to his name. Continue, continue to just be magnified in him and recognize his glory and his authority. Amen. Love you. Praise God for you.